Good morning. My name is Dr. Arun Upneja, Dean of the School of Hospitality Administration at Boston University. On behalf of the faculty, staff, students, a warm welcome to everyone attending today, the third of our Distinguished Speaker Series of 2021. We have another three events sprinkled throughout the semester. A uh, week from today, we have um, Chef Douglas William, who will be on, on March 19th, March 26th, we have our annual leadership summit where it'll be, it'll kick off with the keynote address by Peter Greenberg, the Emmy winning um, investigative reporter and producer from CBS News, followed by our icon of the industry award presentation to the legendary restauranter, Danny Meyer, CEO and founder of Union Square Hospitality. So please visit our website for the school and sign up for these events. We would love to see you here. Before I introduce our guest today, please note that we would love to have your questions and uh, please write them in the chat addressed to Professor Leora Lance and time permitting, we will be happy to ask them on your behalf uh, to the guest today. And the questions that were asked earlier while during registration, uh, we will also be trying to ask those questions as well. So without further ado, um, I am very, very happy and excited to present um, two dear friends of our school. Robbie Earl graduated in 2015, and I have very pleasant memories of multiple conversations I had with him in my office while he was here, uh, the good conversations, uh, Robbie. Um, after he graduated, he joined the leading talent agency, WME IMG, as manager of marketing and business development. After working for a couple of years, he has now joined his dad in creating exciting new ventures, including the virtual dining concepts that are reshaping our dining experiences. So welcome, Robbie. Good morning, Dr. Abnasia. Thank you for having me. Of course, it's wonderful to see you. We also have here today with us the acclaimed restaurant entrepreneur and impresario and Robbie's father, Robert Earl. You could say that he has rocked the restaurant world by building the famous celebrity-driven theme restaurants, Hard Rock Cafe and Planet Hollywood. He has hosted TV shows and has owned and owns many restaurant companies. For everyone attending today, please zoom in carefully because it is Robert Earl who's writing the next chapter in the story of modern dining. Please welcome Robert Earl. Good morning, Dean Aaron. Thank you so much for the time today. Go easy on us. It's only 7.30 in the morning in Beverly Hills. Um, I might go easy on a Shah Lum here today, but uh, may not, Rob, may not be on you. But let's see. Let's see how the conversation goes. We want to get to know both of you a little bit. So let me start with Robbie. Um, can you talk a little bit about your life? Where did you grow up and... Uh, where did you go to school? Sure. Um, I grew up in Orlando, Florida. It was a very interesting upbringing in a restaurant family, as you all know. Um, I was sent to work at a very young age in all the restaurant department. Hey. Um, at the beginning of it, I pretty much hated it. But towards the end of it, I started to see the rewards um, and I started to really fall in love with the industry. Um, that's when uh, we discovered Boston University. Um, I'd attended there for four years. It was a fantastic time. I had some of your fellow professors uh, who were on the call today. Um, and from there, I went on to WME, um, ending up back in our business. Um, and now we're doing a number of different innovative things all across the board. Fantastic. I'm happy to hear. So you... Did you wash dishes? Did you wait tables? So you did work in the restaurant. That's good to hear. It's a good background. Um, but growing celebrity culture has been part of your what you know your family for for many generations. I know that your grandfather was a very famous singer um, in fifties and sixties in England, and and your dad has of course is friends with so many people. So give us a sense into your life. Um, how much were you involved in the celebrity culture? You know, for example, did you have dinners with Arnold Schwarzenegger? Did you have lunch with 
Sylvester Stallone? Did you maybe take some karate lessons with Bruce Willis? Or did your dad keep, you know, the family away from this celebrity culture that you were a part of? <laughs> um, I had quite a bit of experience in it. Uh, there are many, many stories that I could go back and tell you of uh, fun dinners. In terms of sparring, I have sparred with Jason Statham. Uh, I lost, unfortunately, but uh, I I'm sure you could see I was unmatched there. Um, but uh, a lot of my childhood, I got to grow up uh, around these uh, infamous characters, including my father. So they definitely shaped who I am today. Um, and they definitely prepared me for all types of situations and dealing with different talent, which I do as a day-to-day -day in my role at Virtual Dining Concepts. Fantastic. So we have a lot of students that are watching um, and of course alumni watching as well. So can you talk a little bit about your time at Shaw and what were your favorite classes? What did you learn? What was your experience here? Anything that comes to your mind? Sure. Um, well, uh, as you know, um, I was very fond of Professor Oceans. Uh, that was my first class coming into um, BU. So I was very sad to hear the news of what had happened. Um, but now we're, uh, we've, we've donated to the program and look forward to continuing his legacy um, and continuing to bring the energy that he brought to the school with his class and in so many other ways. Um, I also participated in many different professors classes, including Professor Lands, who is on the call. Um, I think my fondest memories um, just involve my interactions with some of the students uh, who are now in various positions around the industry. A funny story for you, uh, Dr. Upnasia. Um, the other day, uh, I was reached out to an old colleague of a colleague, an old college student um, of mine called Trip, and Trip now works uh, at Toast. And because of that relationship, you know, we've now looked at developing ways of how we can expand virtual dining concepts with Toast and how we can educate them on what's going on in the virtual restaurant industry. So, you know, just having him on my team for many of the projects that we used to do in the different classes and the overall interactions uh, with the professors um, helped shape uh, my philosophies today. I think the most uh, exciting part for me about uh, Shaw was just the overall attitude of the professors. You know, I looked at uh, NYU, I looked at Cornell, um, and BU really stood out to me because of uh, the overall attitude of the professors. And it was one where I can teach you a lot, a lot of things if you're willing to learn, um, but I can also learn from you, which was a shocking philosophy uh, for me to learn uh, and hear about, especially from a professor and someone who knew uh, more than I knew. But just that attitude is what I think is the very essence of hospitality uh, and dealing with people. Fantastic, so good to hear. And uh, shout out to Trip as well. Um, very good to hear, I remember him uh, when he was here. Um, and also thanks for contributing to the My Questions Fund. He was a mainstay of our school for so many years and we have now created a permanent endowed fund. And so his name will continue to live on uh, in perpetuity at, at Shaw. So um, let's turn to Robert. Um, as I mentioned before, your father was a singer. Um, and so was that your introduction to the show business? Can you talk a little bit about him and your influence to the show business and exposure through your dad? Sure. I'm glad my son's allowing me to speak. Um, in, in essence, um, Dean, I came from a showbiz family. I had absolutely no talent to perform. So I did the next best thing, which was to go into hospitality. Um, whilst I was at college in the United Kingdom, a comparable type of um, department to the one that you run at the University of Surrey, I had the opportunity to um, go into any of the large companies, but I chose um, to go and work for an entrepreneur. And I've always believed that the closer you can get to the decision makers in where the students that are on today can land when they graduate, the faster they will rise. 
It is important, as you said, to do all the basics, but it's also important to become noticed. And you need to be in an environment where you are close to decision makers that can teach you and help with your rise. So going back to your question, I think that I've always seen entertainment and celebrity uh, molded together with food and drink and hospitality and now lodging. Um, we're now in the hotel business, we're in the casino business, all using the Planet Hollywood brand. And it's just a mild departure away from my life and um, everything that I've done uh, forever and all the circles that I've mixed in. I'm very lucky because I've been traditionally trained. There's no job that I haven't done, but I've also had the opportunity to operate businesses in most countries in the world and, and touch the decision makers in each of those countries. Um, I have to be very honest. I absolutely do not mind at all the loss of the show business, if you claim you're no talent there, has been the gain of the hospitality industry. We are thrilled that you're here. Um, so can you talk, um, how exactly did you find your way? What were your initial beginning experience of working in the hospitality <coughs> sector? Um, well, yes, I started in downtown London and after graduating from university during the university just like your courses when Robbie went to Hong Kong um, I was in uh, London I worked at a very big hotel it was fascinating um, I learned so much there and I was at the Savoy Hotel in the kitchen and then I went to work for um, a very famous and very secretive businessman who's one of the richest people in the world now and um, um, he gave me huge amount of room to uh, expand things for him in my early 20s. So we made lots of mistakes, but we learned a lot at the same time. And I combined entertainment and food and drink. So we created medieval banquets. We created Scottish evenings and Cockney themed evenings that you would call a dinner show. And we became the market leader around the world in this business. And the institutional investors loved us because unlike any other restaurant, we had over 50% of our business booked a year out. It would be included in the package tours that Americans and, and, and other um, countries visiting the UK had costed into their trip. So, we created these dinners that had sword fighters, fire eaters, jugglers, jesters, magicians, whilst you were dining, a six course meal that you consumed just with a dagger, an unlimited wine, an unlimited beer. And um, so it was very, very experiential. And um, that allowed us to take the company public very early on. And um, at a certain point in time, as a parent, I was, uh, I was traveling like on a weekly basis between Orlando and London and the kids were growing up and I decided to stabilize in America and we sold the company um, to a much larger international leisure company and that gave me the opportunity to purchase Hard Rock Cafe, which was a fledgling business back in the late eighties. I think when I bought it, there might have been four open and two or three, including Boston, uh, which I think we opened in maybe 89, um, under construction. Um, so my love affair with Boston goes back a very long way. Great. Um, I think I'm not sure that I know the other people involved, but I think uh, for most people, celebrity dining, the connection between celebrities, entertainment and dining is inextricably linked with your name. So um, a lot of the, many of the guests today were born after uh, the heydays of Planet Hollywood and Hard Rock Cafe. It was a thrilling concept of connecting celebrities with the brand of a restaurant. So can you describe why, why what was it so appealing at that point? I mean, the, the picture you painted of this six course meal, I, I wish we had access to that today. Um, now I know why the merch sales declined, Aaron. Um, but um, um, 
the, have they become the, nerdy now because I'm wearing it? <laughs> um, the, the, the answer is that um, celebrity and famous people have always been used to ignite trial in any business. If you look on TV today, particularly during the pandemic, there are very few ads that are not celebrity inspired. It makes them more recognizable. It, it helps broaden the audience and they have their own sector of followers. So in the days of opening Planet Hollywood in 1991, we were lucky enough to take the three biggest um, global movie stars. And the reason I say they were biggest and many people might take exception with that is action movies were the only type of movie that transcended every international barrier. So you might have been um, a more serious actor or in comedy or romance, but that didn't have the same translation across the world. Whereas Schwarzenegger, Stallone, Willis were just instantly recognizable around the world. And we were fortunate enough to uh, invite them to become shareholders with us. And they loved the idea of having a second business where they were more in the business side than just acting. And it just built and built and built, became the hottest restaurant in the world. And 50% um, of our sales at one point were driven by merchandise, which had a massive bottom line on it. Our merch sales have declined since then as a 30 year old brand, but I'm pleased to say that young Earl on this call now has the responsibility and the budget to relaunch mm -hmm. the clothing and he's got four different clothing lines coming out, obviously with a much heavier online play. Um, but I, I could go on for a long time talking about the use of celebrity and hopefully later on in, in, on this call, we will tell you how we are using celebrity in a more current manner to really help the global restaurant community. Fantastic. So I think let's get to it. So I think <laughs> everyone is very curious to hear more about the virtual dining concept. So Robbie, let me ask you, um, can you help us understand the difference between virtual dining versus ghost kitchens? Sure. Uh, well, there's many different definitions at the moment, but the way we define it is a ghost kitchen is essentially a WeWork facility uh, where you can come in and rent kitchen space, very small square footage. There's about 20 or so kitchens in it. Uh, you share back of house facilities and it's all connected under one technology hub. A virtual kitchen or a virtual restaurant, as we call it, uses existing brick and mortar facilities or existing kitchen facilities to create delivery only brands. Fantastic. Now, um, Robbie, um, I think your dad alluded to the fact that you're trying to bring in the next generation of, of um, people and celebrities. And um, I have to be honest, when I heard Mr. Beast Burger, um, I had to Google what is Mr. Beast to figure out that he is probably one of the most famous uh, YouTube. Um, just you know, tells you that I need to go and um, watch more YouTube. How did you get Mr. Beast involved? I mean, he's got billions of views on on YouTube, so he's a he's a big. Now I can say he's he's pretty big and cool. Well, I think we did our job because you had to go Google him and look him up, so you obviously heard about him. Um, that came about, actually, I was talking to him and his team uh, on a different front. Um, I was working on a separate project at the time uh, that was based around forming the planet Hollywood and hard rock of this day. But the challenge with doing it today versus back then is accessibility. You know, back then social media didn't exist um, and, you know, you couldn't become famous almost overnight. Uh, the conversation dissolved, but I came back a little bit later once we'd formed virtual dining concepts. And after two or three years of the iterations and figuring out the perfect model, and they sort of fell in love with the business uh, and the idea of helping existing restaurants um, versus using the ghost kitchen model. 
Um, and from there, uh, we said about the partnership terms. Um, we uncovered the food that they would like to explore. My father was probably the most upset that we did burgers because they are very difficult to deliver. Um, and since then, you know, we've grown uh, uh, massively, which we're going to tell you about. And our relationship uh, with Beast is fantastic. He's a fascinating character. Um, he definitely has that trait where he understands people so well. Um, and it's rare that you see it in someone in such a young age, he's 22. Um, I see it in people like my father, especially. And I see it in Guy Fieri is probably the other uh, most infamous character that I've seen that ability to understand what people want and really relate to anyone, no matter their background. And I think Beast has really captured that spirit in what he does uh, in his content and definitely at the core of who he is. I think that was an, uh, that was a great. Um, I know I was introduced to Mr. B, so I, I need to go watch some of his videos. I like the concept what he did. But They're you mentioned, guy, yeah, uh, I'm sure they are. I mean, you know, he's got billions of views. So if you look um, closely, you can find my cameo in uh, the uh, um, world's first free restaurant video. It's about two minutes and thirty three seconds in. I'm just kidding, but okay. Uh, but I'll definitely be sure to watch that, uh, Ravi. But Robert, so Ravi mentioned Guy Fieri, and I know that he has been your friend for, for a long time. So can you talk a little bit about your partnership with Guy Fieri? How did it come about and what were the discussions and what well, did you decide just, to just launch? To make, um, of course, just to make sure there's a clear understanding for all our uh, wonderful viewers today, um, the premise of our new company, Virtual Dining Concepts, is one where we are going to existing restaurants, hotels, anyone with a kitchen, and we are offering them ready-made brands to be added to their portfolio. Robbie and I believe that if we look at the business pre-COVID, during COVID, post-COVID, with a few exceptions, everyone always needed more sales. And what we have done is we've approached it that we all try and maximize our dining business. We all try to maximize the collective title to go business, which can be broken down into anything from curbside delivery to drive through to relationships with third party platforms. But now we're the market leaders in offering this third segmentation, which is have a virtual brand. The definition of a virtual brand is online delivery only, no bricks and mortar. And contrary to renting a cloud kitchen or anything else, we are going to independent restaurants and enterprise and hotel groups and saying, do you have spare capacity? We are restaurateurs creating for restaurateurs different brands. And they're all celebrity backed, which tie that back up to our experiences of Hard Rock and Planet Hollywood. Celebrity is our partner in the brands and helps us ignite trial and they curate the brands. Now, sometimes they take it even further because this is a classic example, our relationship with the number one TV chef, Gordon Ramsay will take exception with that, in the United States, Guy Fieri. Guy Fieri is this amazing character. He does so much for people so quietly, not seeking the press like many other people do. When there's a, uh, any of these fires in um, Northern California, he is on the front line feeding everyone. He's just an amazing guy. He's 40% of the entire programming of Food Network. They have over 80 different shows, yet, 40% of the airtime is dedicated to him. He's got five shows on at the moment, a sixth one coming, which it's quite possible Robbie and I are in um, because we own another brand with him called Chicken Guy, which is a fast casual brand, started on Walt Disney, opened in Miami, opened in the 70, um, uh, no, opened in the um, San Francisco Stadium, opened in the former Washington Redskins, stadium and there's a series more of those opening 
and it's a franchise product as well. We did Boston and there's one coming soon. We did Tennessee, we've done Texas. I think we've done Baltimore as franchises. So we went to Guy and said, do not miss out on this new virtual phenomena. And we entered into a partnership with him where he took his trademark name, we're going to Flavortown. And we created together Guy Fieri's Flavortown Kitchen. It has only been open around for a number of weeks, but it's off the charts. The sales are amazing. And we currently operate that from under 200 distribution points in America that we principally own because we needed to control that one <clears throat> for the fellow restaurateurs on the call, there's about 125 SKUs because Guy is, he does everything from scratch. Whereas the Mr. Beast Burger is probably only 14 SKUs. And obviously for market partners that we give geographic exclusives to, some brands are a lot easier than others. And, and so Guy's is a huge success. And it's an homage to all of the cuisines that you see him tasting, developing on diners, dives, drive-ins, all those type of things. They're pretty outrageous and very calorific. And we have a series of different brands coming out, famous IP, different celebrities. We've got a brand coming out with the TV star, Steve Harvey. Robbie did a deal with another wonderful young man that Aaron, I'm, I'm sure you listen to his music all the time, called Little Yachty. Um, we're, 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 um, that was a joke. We're doing a deal, um, well, we've done the deal with this wonderful chef called Buddy Valestra. You know him as the cake boss. And he has a massive factory in Jersey City and he's producing for us eight different cakes, great flavors by the slice. And we will be offering that regionally to food operators that have kitchens to become what we call now the last mile. This is the buzzword in our industry. The closer you can get to the community, the college community, the residential community, the office community, the quicker you can deliver, the less deterioration there will be on the product. <clears throat> to Robbie's point, I wasn't happy about burgers because have you ever been to a restaurant, ordered a burger and then said, could I have it in 45 minutes time, please? Um, <clears throat> excuse me, because that's clearly what happens in the delivery world. And certain food types were not designed for that. The consumer in some ways can be very knowledgeable and picky and in other ways the younger audience are looking for ease if it's coming quickly <clears throat> even if it arrives pizza somewhat cold they will just zap it again but if they didn't have to leave their chair um, and can buy it in that manner it's the most important decision So that's um, Robert. Let me go back a little bit when you started talking about the virtual um, dining concept. So, when restaurants sign up, um, do you provide them turnkey? So, do you provide them all the ingredients? Do you provide them prepared <coughs> foods? Are the foods being made in some central commissary in some? Okay, so, what, how, describe that process a little bit. E each brand is somewhat different okay. because of the different. Um, I've got such a bad throat. I'm sorry. <clears throat> um, Robbie, why don't you answer that one? Sure. Um, so we start by looking at the kitchen package of every restaurant. Um, and it's a very analytical approach for how many flat tops, how many fryers are there, how many pizza restaurants. From there, we design a brand that can fit within your existing infrastructure, but doesn't compete with your main business. So Arun's Pizza Shop, uh, can also carry our Tiger Bites brand, which is a boneless chicken wing product produced by Tyson. Um, in terms of central commissaries, we're moving in very different directions and innovating all across the supply chain. And I think uh, the fascinating thing about this is 
the volume that we're able to produce, you'll see many different developments over time, all the way back down to the manufacturing level. So each one will have a different model. Okay, so let's um, uh, so let's let's dig a little bit deeper into this um, into this model. It is not going to compete with, and I know that a lot of people are really concerned that. Uh, these virtual brands are going to be cannibalizing the sales of your existing restaurant or so this is separate or is this somehow connected to the existing restaurants? Um, this is an additional income stream for any operator. This is a way to build your top line. And because of the way these are designed, they throw a huge amount down to the individual units bottom line. It is predicated on not having additional labor. <clears throat> we provide a tablet. The tablet is what we call agnostic. It has every single delivery company on it. It also has on it a consumer direct app, which we have built. And it miraculously pops up the orders. And you in your kitchen would have been trained <clears throat> to operate this menu. You would have all the ingredients that we source for you and you cook it or you finish it, you put it in the packaging and you get it to the front door where the Uber, DoorDash, Postmates, Grubhub driver will be picking it up. It is a way of the future and I am predicting that the entire industry will have a virtual brand within three, four years. There are a lot of our large enterprises in this country are already doing it. So if you take um, a thousand Applebee's or if you take um, 1500 Chili's or if you take, um, um, uh, who just announced one, TGI Fridays, they all have their own virtual brand. I think that's a distraction for them because for all the operators on the line, I think we know that the newest thing in always gets our team moving over to that. And they tend to forget um, their time allocation on the more difficult older issues. And so we offer to take those responsibilities over for the operator and you have to buy your food, buy your package, packaging, cook the product, and we've done everything else. We onboard you, we do your social, your PR, your advertising, your marketing. We have training videos. We have a culinary team that goes out there to help you. We have a hotline and we have all the distribution and all the product source for you. Fantastic. So for a restaurant operator um, who has the kitchen, who has the labor, who has the space and the spare capacity, you're providing all the ingredients, you're providing one-stop shopping for all the ingredients, and there is no extra work. You just finish the product and you put it up at the front. Are they involved in marketing at all, or is that also totally done by your team? It's, it's completely done by us. And um, if things go bad in the education world, we would love to hire you because you've got the pitch perfect so you could be out there selling it for us. And um, I would take this opportunity for any graduates this year, come talk to us. This is one of the fastest expanding companies in the whole food space. I think we've gone from 20 to 80 in just the last two, three months. And um, we're in dire need of great talent. Folks, uh, this is Robert, uh, the greatest uh, PR and marketing <laughs> brain out there. So uh, thank you for that pitch, uh, Robert. I'm sure our alumni and our students are listening to you very carefully and, and um, you will see a lot of uh, resumes shortly. So uh, let me just dig a little bit more deeper into, um, uh, you know, right now there is pandemic times and all the restaurant kitchens are, you know, most of them are, they have a lot of spare capacity, but you know, fast forward one year, business is booming, everyone is going out and restaurant kitchens are struggling to just take care of the customers that are in, in house, in person. And that's where most chefs want to focus their attention. And now suddenly you have all of these orders popping in, 
which um, can the kitchens handle once the pandemic is over? Um, well, I would not describe the marketplace pre-COVID like you just did. I think there's always successful restaurants in every city, but I think most of the seasoned people on this call will agree that we have spare capacity. We can have peak hours where we could have issues, but this is designed to help. I would also submit to you that, as we all know, work habits are now changing. So where we had customers perhaps downtown for restaurants, for lunch, those people are now going to be staying at home. Um, a very large percentage, you've seen how many people are downsizing their office for the future. Very big companies have found out that it's more economic and it's just socially more acceptable to work from home. So that's just an example of an audience that is going to need online delivery. And what we really do, and I would just want to make the point, and there are others doing the same as us, is we offer you essentially, but not legally, a franchise. We give you a geographic area and we give you a roadmap. It, there's no way an independent restaurant could do the packaging that we do and the beautiful boxes, because unfortunately the minimum orders there's no way that the individual restaurant could have the celebrity talent. So they're all availing themselves of a national platform. Um, there are restaurants that will go back to maximum capacity, but I'm just talking more industry-wide. And um, for the hoteliers on the line, there's been a lot of aggregation over the last few years where they might have a kitchen that might be the three day park kitchen for the restaurant that we have to all keep open and it might be doing room service and it might be doing banquets so think of it like that this is an extension it's not a relationship that's consumer facing in the building it's a relationship with your kitchen it is do you have spare capacity in that kitchen and we will find the equipment that you utilize the least after studying your system and we will offer you a brand. So we have a chicken brand that we did with a great rapper. Um, Robbie plays golf with him. His name is Tiger. And, um, and we, we have a deal with Tyson and Tyson have a boneless chicken wing that is superb and it is pre-cooked. Therefore, it is only the finishing of it that takes place inside the kitchen. So there's all different levels of simplicity, but getting back to your question, we believe that virtual is here to stay. It will be a growing component of your top line sales as a percentage. It is um, a, a growing component of online delivery. The stats for online delivery are just keeping growing and growing. And for an independent restaurant, we are offering them a complete ready-made way to be in the virtual world. And I think that more than compensates for um, um, coming into the market. I also believe that there is not going to be, I, I don't believe the media about the loss of restaurants from the landscape, I believe we've lost sadly through COVID operators, but that building is not going to be repurposed. There are no alternatives. Retailers, as we all know, has suffered greatly. And so I don't agree with what we read that 100,000 restaurants are closing. I think 100,000 operators are going and they will be repurposed hopefully by the same operator so that they can get their income back. But the kitchen is there, it's been built, the hood is there, the fabric is there. And so people will come in second generation and rebrand the space. We're experiencing that ourselves. My team are in New York at the moment, trying to acquire quite a few different restaurants. So that restaurant that has been reported that it's gone, it was the operator that's gone. So I think the market is going to be very buoyant again. 
And like everyone, we all read the same press. Instinctively, it looks like we could still, as operators, have a decent summer at this moment. Right, and I think, and I agree with you, it is uh, very tragic that a lot of people in our industry who really love the restaurant industry, love food and love creating their creations for people are, are sort of, are, are on the losing end of this, and, but the restaurants, and, and I think also you make a very good point that let's hope that the second gen, either some of the same people come back or the second generation comes back. But um, I think there are still some critics who, are talking about the overall pie and saying if there are some resources, some some money that was spent by the consumers on restaurants and and dining, now if some of that is diverted towards virtual dining, that's taking away from local um, restaurants. So, uh, are you thinking that you're actually expanding the pie, or are you just taking a share of the existing pie? Um. Well, I've obviously done a lousy job for the last hour because it's the restaurant that's the main beneficiary. They, they are effectively licensing our brand and adding it to their core bricks and mortar brand. So I don't think the spread changes. Um, we've probably got over 1,000 restaurants already that are working with us um, by the end of Q2 just on Mr. Beast. And we have a plethora of other brands coming out and we're reaching out to the entire independent restaurant community saying we're here to help we're here to build your sales we're not taking the sales away we're so there could be one guy um that's upset and a, another lady that owns another restaurant that's her sales have um gone up we are getting some of the most heartwarming videos and accolades and testimonials. Hi, my name is Mr. and Mrs. So-and-so from Sparks, Nevada. I was about to close down permanently. Thank you, Mr. Beast, I'm now hiring more staff. So, so it's a swings and roundabouts, Arun. Right, right. so I, Robert, I, I think you misunderstood what I was not saying that the restaurants clearly benefit, I think, um, um, the restaurants are clearly benefiting because it's adding to the top line and you make a very good point that there is a lot of excess capacity, <clears throat> even in the best of times. There are, I was talking from a consumer perspective, if I'm going to spend um, $500 a month on eating out and dining, and if I'm diverting part of my, so is, is in your perspective, is the total money that is spent by consumers, is that increasing? Has there been any changes in that? What do you foresee yes, for the future? I see. I'm sorry I misunderstood you. That's because I didn't go to BU. Um, so, so our view, and it's more anecdotal at this stage, is one of the few benefits of COVID has been how many people have experienced delivery. As a consequence, they found a price point that has been comparable to what they would have spent in a supermarket. And now they don't have to cook it. Now they can order it on the way home. They can have nothing to wash up, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so we think if there were a loser, it will be the supermarket because once restaurants open again and we all go back out, the market does not believe that online delivery will go down. In fact, the market is predicting massive growth and now the market is predicting that the online delivery space will be split far more bricks and mortar brands virtual brands with virtual rising all the time we think there's over a hundred thousand different virtual brands today the majority of those the majority are single unit um, what that means, um, Arun, is that you own a steak restaurant and on the steak restaurant you had ribs and you decided to create a virtual rib brand where you use the rib that you had and maybe you come up with four different rubs for it and six different spices and four different sides to go with it and you called it Arun's ribs. Um, so we think that that marketplace might decline because it's hard for those independents to compete 
if we're putting a lot of money behind a national platform and we can give you the celebrity and we can give you the packaging and the know-how and the lower prices. But as a sector, it's an aid to all restaurants. Um, I think you make a very, very good point, Robert, and I think you might um, you, I think you might be right. There might be so much more expansion in this uh, sector. I um, hope so, so I a, because we put millions into it. <laughs> um, so um, I have some questions here. Um, and one of the questions uh, came from some industry people who are watching today. How do you handle quality control when dealing with multiple concepts in the same kitchen? And I have to say, many people ask the same question. Yes, um, quality control on online delivery is a huge issue before we even talk about our brands. If you look at that sector, the majority of issues come from the distance the driver has to travel and the drivers themselves and the issues that go on. As a consequence, the food is deteriorating and so one tries to improve the packaging. Our biggest play in this, which um, might sound a little shocking to the um, viewers today, is we want to get our brands up to 2,000 uh, distribution points for every brand that we do. And the reason for that is the shorter distance that will then be the result for the delivery. Each brand that we do has a different level of risk in terms of perfection and standardization. So for example, Robbie's just developed a new brand that is eight flavors of mac and cheese. I love this one because it is baked in the receptacle that it's going to be delivered in. And as a consequence, I feel it's going to have the lowest complaints ever for a hot item because it's going to maintain its temperature. Burgers have been an issue. As I said, you don't create a burger to eat 40 minutes later. And every delivery is 40 minutes from when the order goes into the kitchen and the time it takes to cook it, <clears throat> package it, is never less than 15 to 20 minutes. Now the driver has to pick it up and then deliver it generally within a three mile radius and that gets you to 40 minutes so <clears throat> there's only so much one can do robbie i think you wanted to add something on that uh yeah i can add something on that um i'd say there's multiple lines of defense for us i think the first way we do it is the way we create each brand um uh, i would say the best analogy is something like the speedy system uh, that McDonald's created early on. I think we've done something very similar here for virtual brands. Um, and I'm not going to go into too much detail about it, but everything from the training to the storage to the prep uh, from an operator's perspective and an owner's perspective has been thought through. So that's our first line of defense. Second line of defense, uh, as you're aware, we use mystery shoppers in our industry. Um, we monitor reviews. Um, and, you know, we track those very carefully, but as my father pointed out, delivery is tough. You know, it accounts for what, 20% of your traditional business, uh, as a brick and mortar restaurant. And of that 20%, how many are good reviews to begin with? So we've sort of built a business here, uh, that needs to catch up with the rate of innovation. So everything from the packaging to the food product. Um, isn't where it needs to be to support where the on-demand delivery economy is going. And then thirdly, you know, uh, from a technology perspective, we're creating a system that can very easily monitor these things, um, that can interact with the uh, restaurants on a daily basis, um, and a number of other quality checks um, that I'm not going to share with you yet. I'm going to leave you on a bit of a cliffhanger, but we are uh, building some pretty substantial things that you'll see that everything will look entirely different six, to, uh, six months to a year from now. Great. So one of the questions that's, um, uh, that just popped up on my screen is how to improve the delivery package box to keep in the cooked food quality? 
That's a really good question. Obviously, each item has different issues, and we're all learning about this. There are so many different arguments, whether there are little holes in the box, whether you put the food in a sleeve before you put it in the box, what packaging keeps cooking the item, um, do you want the steam to leave? Um, there are different views as to whether you fill it in its entirety, um, thus keeping the product warming itself, or do you leave room for air at the top? So there's just so many aspects to it. Um, and um, you just have to keep looking at it. And for the operators here looking for their own packaging, um, if they find the food genre that they're going with, they need to buy everyone's business samples that are out there um, and, and then see which one was the most effective. When we cook something, we then leave it 20 minutes, 30 minutes, 40 minutes, 50 minutes, up to an hour to see what the deterioration is. In the case of Mr. Beast, they all wanted to start with real rough and ready, simple packaging, and it was just a wrap of a foil. Now we've gone to, it's just being launched, um, fabulous Instagrammable boxes and wonderful sleeves that go in beforehand that will improve the experience, improve the brand, and also uh, make the uh, product stay better for longer. Um, so um, a, 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 a quick, uh, just uh, uh, off the wall idea. I know that a few years ago, and this might still be happening, uh, the pizza delivery industry was experimenting with vans in which pizzas would be cooked by the time they're delivered. So to shorten the time between when it comes out of the oven. So uh, do you think that with the virtual brands at some point you might go to specialized vans rather than um, you know, normal you know, people putting in their cars and driving it to the customers? Robin? I think you've seen, uh, there's a few examples in our industry, funny enough now, you know, a friend of mine's doing a coffee brand where on demand it shows up uh, once you order it on the app and they produce it right in front of you. Um, but that would uh, go against the grain of what we stand for and what we're doing, which is using existing food service facilities. I don't think um, that trend is growing enough to replace what's already there. I think doing what we're doing and relying on the existing infrastructure, but giving it a new model, <coughs> generate incremental revenue that wouldn't have been there before, uh, is a much better bet. I think that's a very, very good point that you are trying to support the local restaurant um, companies that have the spare capacity and are really hurting during this time of the pandemic. And and uh, so uh, thank you, Ravi, for doing that. And Robert, I know uh, your friend Guy Fieri did a whole lot for the restaurant employees and with the fund yeah. that he's created. So um, I truly appreciate uh, everything that both of you are doing and, and your entire circle to sort of support uh, the restaurant and the food industry that we all love, love so much. So um, I want to, so we have a lot of um, students and, and young alumni and professionals watching. So Robbie, um, what advice, since you were a student at Shaw, what advice would you give to students that are at Shaw today? What advice would I give them to take advantage of the opportunities at Shaw or advice Fantastic. would you give them coming out of university? Um, either one or both. <clears throat> um, well, I do one across the board. I'd say take lots of opportunities that are offered to you. Try multiple things. Not everything's going to stick, um, but I promise you if you keep trying, something will stick for you. Um, I didn't always know that I wanted to be in this industry and know I wanted to end up doing virtual brands and building restaurant concepts and so on and so forth. Um, it took many different trials and uh, you're gonna fail multiple times, um, but that's all part of it. And all of those experiences will help shape you. But I would say, take the opportunities that are coming your way, try many different things, um, and eventually you will find out what it is you're meant to be doing um, and, and what you believe in the most. Good advice. Thank you, Robbie. 
So Robert, before I ask you for advice, I think I see a few more questions popping up. So let me see if I can ask. Um, uh, so one of them was, uh, have you considered partnering with retail grocery brands for all of these celebrity driven theme brands that you're in the virtual dining concept? So people can buy if they don't have access to um, anything that's close by for delivery. Um, <clears throat> the answer is yes. Um, th there are many ways that one can do that. And, and of course, um, retail with Instacart, with, with all the grocery stores has been revolutionized already. And we are in various dialogues, particularly with supermarkets that have certain areas of the supermarket that their production potential, the capacity that they could do is enormous. Um, but thank you for the suggestion. Of course, yeah, uh, anything. So what about, um, have you, since you've already been operating um, of this for some time now, a question is uh, who's responsible for error and recovery if a guest is unhappy with the service? Um, there are many unhappy guests. Um, that is the nature of online. And um, we have set up two extensive teams that basically cover every hour that America is open for delivery business. Uh, one team is in Vegas, one team is in Florida. And we're priding ourselves on the speed. We're ahead of everyone. Um, we've learned a lot through working with Mr. Beast and how the world is and how younger people are so demanding of instant answers um, and we have many systems there are a lot of complaints out there unfortunately that are not real we've had some horrific ones we had someone that destroyed us with a review and when we called the person they said no 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 everything was fine and we said but you just gave us a scathing review and photos and everything. They said, that's how they grow their following because they managed to get into a dialogue with hundreds of thousands of followers of a larger celebrity. We have people that um, are just looking for refunds after they have already consumed the meal satisfactorily. Um, so it's part of the business and, and part of the growing pains. Um, and I think some of those things will always be there, but you have to be fast to respond. You have to try and take a problem and deal with it very quickly and deal with it one-on-one. -on -one. Um, we've just launched a fantastic new promo with Mr. Beast that is rather like the old days of McDonald's. Um, there you are. And we're giving away a cup when you order direct from his app and then every two weeks there is a different image on the cup and i can tell you that out of a thousand cups um done in certain markets yesterday 13 people did not get them that's how on our game we are we know who they are where they are and we're rectifying each of those um by sending them today etc cetera, etc cetera. so if the message there is to be on your game. Fantastic. Robert, uh, before we close, I wanted to give you an opportunity. I mean, I know among the people that I know in the industry, you have your pulse on the consumers. Um, you have a pulse on what's going to happen in the industry. What advice do you have for, for students, for um, young professionals, those who are wanting to make their mark on their career? Um, it's the perfect time for someone emerging from BU or a young alumni. The whole, all of the hospitality industry is changing. The needs are changing. There's so many new directions, new departments being created, new areas of each of the, um, um, the hotel side, the restaurant side, the industrial catering side, uh, the delivery side that there's just big opportunities. Every employer is looking for a younger team that are closer to the age group that are consuming. And it's just a great time to be in our industry. There's going to be a lot of issues in the first 
year, there are going to be markets that grow back quicker than others. Somewhere like Vegas or Orlando, where we do a lot of business, will be the most resilient. There is a massive movement in domestic tourism away from big cities. So there's a whole area there for the people that are listening now that they could get in just because of what we learned about staying away from people, learning to stay away from the cities and how beautiful our America is. There's just so many areas there which are just virgin territory for, for new business. Thank, thank you, Robert. Thank you, Robbie. I really, truly appreciate and thank you from on behalf of the school, the students, the faculty for coming on time, giving us your time. Thank you to all the faculty and staff who have um, helped put this together. And in particular, thank you so much to everyone watching and listening today. Please join us next week for Chef Douglas Williams and the week after for our annual leadership summit. I thank you very much. Until then, please stay safe and healthy, and I hope you get to enjoy some good food. Thank you. Bye.